Hey, good morning. How are y'all today? That doesn't sound very good. That doesn't sound very good. All right, so let's try it again. How are y'all today? Awesome, awesome. I'm so glad, man. I'm excited about today. Uh, any day that we get to kick off a service with baptism is a spectacular day, and uh, today we're going to get to do that. And as these guys make their way down into the baptistry right now, let me give you a couple of uh, words of announcement for the service today. Um, we're going to baptize, then we're going to sing a little bit, then we're going to read the scriptures together a little bit. So uh, if you've got a pen or a highlighter or a Bible, a uh, paper, ink, and cow kind of Bible, right? Or electronic Bible, whether you got it on your phone or your tablet or however you read your scripture, I want you to have that today. We're going to be in Ephesians. This is our second week in Ephesians. And I only did two verses last week, right? We're doing them all this week. Y'all think I'm joking. We're not. We're doing all of them, the whole thing. So uh, buckle up. It's going to be a big, it's going to be a big day. Uh, if you are a guest with us today, man, I'm just grateful that you are here. Uh, so good to have you here. Uh, so no matter how you got here, no matter where you're from, I just wanted you to know that you are welcome here. And I hope that today is a day that you're encouraged uh, in the Lord. I hope that uh, today is a day that, that you will remember. Uh, if you are a guest with us today, I'd love for you to take one of the purple cards that's in your seat back and just fill that out and drop it in the offering plate as you leave today. Our ushers will be at the end of the service. They will be at the exit doors. And if you're a guest with us today, this is all that we would ask you to, to drop in for us today is just this information card. So I can give you a text or a call this week and just tell you how good it was to have you in our services. See how I can pray for you this week. Um, so y'all ready to get going? Amen. Come on now. Brother Donnie. Together, being able to do this, be able to share them this moment. And um, Corey's talked with Stu, and he's given his heart to the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in a second when, we, uh, when I ask you the questions. But, you know, we always got to remember that supporting people, when, we, when they do this up here, one of the things they're reminding you is, hey, I've just become a believer. I'm getting baptized. Don't forget about me when you see me. I'm going to have day up days and down days, and I want, I'm going to need you to lean on because I'm leaning on Jesus, and he's going to use you to talk with him to help support family members that are coming along. And I think it's great that you're, they're here. So I'm going to start with Corey. You just step right there. No. <laughs> Good. Tough's ready to go. I think he's going to, he was about, I was afraid he's going to cannonball in here. He's ready to go. So he's, he's been excited about it. So, and Corey, who have you placed your faith? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so it is my honor, and I'm going to have you stand right here. I'm going to support your eye. It is my honor, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ in baptism, ready to walk on this life. Get on over here. You saw how it was done, right? Yep. So he's ready to go. And again, you know, tough. I've, I've had tough. Uh, I've played against this little kid. You know, my boys played against him in baseball. I see him all the time. What a, what a cool name. Tough. I mean, I'm telling you right now, if this kid don't grow, grow up to be some great baseball or football player, I don't know. But right now, he, all he wants to do is he's been so excited about becoming 
Christian. He was talking about Wednesday. He was so excited about being baptized. He was talk about. He was, he's nervous. He's and I go. You know what? There's nothing to be nervous about. Jesus paid it all already. You know, you were nervous. You were nervous. He's not nervous. I'm just lying. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and baptize you. You ready? Now, who have you placed your faith? Jesus Christ. That a boy. So it is my honor to baptize you, and your stepdad's gonna help here. We're gonna hold. You. Baptize you, my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son. Holy Spirit, buried with the Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. There he is. Good morning, First Pope. Come on, stand with me. Let's worship together. Open up, so open up the head. 
Has 
Hope you had a good week this week, and uh, if you are, uh, if you have a copy of the Bible this morning, a copy of God's Word, I want you to take it and turn to the book of Ephesians. If you've got your electronic device that you've got a Bible app or something like that on that you hang on with, um, go ahead and find that there. And uh, we are going to be in the book of Ephesians, which was actually not a book, it was actually originally written as a letter. Uh, So it was written as a letter uh, from Paul to the churches in Ephesus. He wanted all those small pockets of believers uh, to read this. Uh, It was written in prison. So Paul was in prison in Rome whenever he wrote it, uh, about A.D. 60 to 62, somewhere in that, uh, in that realm. It's got six chapters, 155 verses, four to five pages in your Bible. Uh, it takes about 20 to 22 minutes to read out loud. So if you've got an iPhone or anything like that and, and you say, well, you know, I don't really have time to read a lot of the Scripture, check your screen usage on some of the apps that you use, like Facebook or Instagram, and just see how much time you spend on there. So if you've got 20 minutes to, to scroll, to, to give yourself a thumb exercise workout on, on the Facebook, then you've got 20 minutes that you could read the entire letter to the Ephesians here. So, uh, you know, whenever we come to church, many people, they kind of feel like, and, and they, they come with the attitude like we're going going to a show, like we're going to the movies, like... Uh, we, we're going to sit and we're going to consume this, and, and you provide the entertainment, right? So they want a, they want a good band, they want a good uh, music, they want the sound and the lights to be right, and they you know, end up feeling like the, the... Brad, I don't know if you ever feel like this, but sometimes I feel like you know, Maximus Decimus Meridius in the movie Gladiator, um, after he gets done and he's like, are you not entertained? You know, like sometimes people come to church like that. And, and they, they want to be entertained, but, but I want you to know that when we assemble, it should be much more than entertainment, right? So there should be an atmosphere of longing and one of learning. There should be an atmosphere of worshiping, an attitude of serving. As a matter of fact, we need, we need people to serve in our, in our kids' area, preschool, children. Um, we need two people before next week. How about that? Let's, let's get two people today. To volunteer to serve once a month. How about that? And that would fill a big hole for us. But we, we should. We should serve our local church. We should come both giving and, and growing. We want to we expand. Uh, we want to mature. And, and you know, you'll, you'll get out of church exactly what you put into it. There is an ROI, a return on investment. So when you come excited and, and ready and hungry, you get more out of it. The same is true with your relationship with Jesus. You will get out of it what you put into it. The same is is true with the scriptures. Whenever you read the Bible and study the Bible, what you get out of it will be what you go into it with. You know, a lot of times we have people that start the new year and they they start and they're like, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. And I I just was reading a document this morning um, that, that has about how long it takes to read every book in the Bible. And did you know that if you'll just read for 12 minutes a day, you'll read, you can read through the entire Bible in a year? If you read six minutes, you say, 12 minutes, I can't read 12 minutes. Six minutes, cut it in half. You can read through the entire New Testament in six months. Six minutes a day. All right? This is, I mean, it's a big book, right? Start to finish, there's a lot of pages there, but it's not, it's not as overwhelming sometimes as we, as we make it out to be. Alistair Begg uh, who is one of my favorite favorite preachers. He's, uh, he's a Scottish dude, and uh, so I love to listen to him talk because he sounds a lot like me, very cultured and sophisticated. But here's what he says. There is no substitute for a daily diet of Scripture. And that's true because when we come to the Scriptures, we, we, we hear from the Lord. This is God's Word. So where the, where the writers of the Bible speak, God speaks. And that, that's a big deal for us. So I want to give you just a couple of quick, uh, a couple of quick methods of, of studying the Bible. So some people just, they start reading it, and they're like, well, I just read it, and I don't really know what to do with that. I just read it. So two pretty easy acronyms that you can take uh, to help you in your study of the Bible. One is the ACTS method, A-C-T-S. So A stands for ASK. If you got a note, a pencil or something, you want to take notes, um, they're, they're, I'm going to just give you a couple. Uh, ACTS stands for ask. So ask God what you 
need to understand about this passage. So if you're going to read some scriptures, a, a chapter, a few verses, just ask God what he wants you to understand. C stands for reading carefully. So don't just blow through it, but, but read carefully. Look for some key words, some key phrases. T is for think. Think about how that applies to your life. S stands for scripture. So at the end, you write out one scripture that stood out to you in your reading. It, it's a simple method, right? If you're beginning to study the Bible, if you've never really taken it upon yourself to, to dive in and, and get into the scriptures on your own, it's a great method to start. Here, here's another one, the SOAP method, S-O-A-P, right? So I think about it like this, get, get yourself cleaned up, right, with the Word of God. It, it does, and it cleans us up. Um, it's an acronym for this, Scripture. So you're going to take your Scripture, and you're going to read the Scripture. O stands for observation. What do I see in this? What are some things that just jump out, some things that are clear? Application. Is there something in my life that I need to adjust because of what I've just read? All right? So, like, if, if you read uh, the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself, and you hate your neighbor, you need to apply that to your life, right? And change some behavior. So scripture, observation, application, and then prayer. Prayer is a key part of any, of any Bible study. Is, uh, you, you talk to God, you hear from God, you listen to God, you read what God says. Uh, there's also thematic uh, study of scripture. So you can say, I want to study about grace, right? So grace is a big theme in Ephesians here. So you might say, I want to, I want to read all I can about grace. And so you just take in your concordance, if you've got a Bible that's got some uh, a concordance in the back, you might be able to find a word like grace. And you can see that grace is going to have, if you've got a Bible like mine, uh, grace is after B. So it's D. I'm still going in the alphabet. I've got terribly non-dexterous fingers here. Grace. Well, it's past glutton. Grace, there's gracious, there's grace. Man, I've got uh, about 20, 25 specifics right here that have got grace in it, scriptures. Uh, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, right there it is. So see, we can link all that stuff together and see what the Word of God has to say on any theme. And then we can do things like we're doing here with the book of Ephesians, this letter of Paul to the Ephesians, is we are studying a book when we study the books of the Bible, we want to pay close attention to the history surrounding uh, when it was written, the background of the author, uh, the original audience, who was it written to. And when we do this, what we find is the Bible really starts to, to take shape and to take life. Whenever I was a kid, I don't know why I did this, but it almost felt like the Bible wasn't real life. It wasn't real history. It was, it was biblical history because we didn't learn it in any other aspect of life, but and it's not world history, it's kind of this subset of history, but it happened at times throughout the history of the world. And it's recorded and, and written down for us so that we will know. So it's important to know what's going on in the rest of the world at the time that this is happening. So Rome has kind of taken over, right? We've got this Roman Empire whenever Paul is writing this letter. And that's a big deal. We want it to, we want it to be not divorced from real life because it's not. These were real people in real times that really had this stuff happen to them. So when Paul, we find out in Acts, he spent about two plus years or so in Ephesus. And he started churches in Ephesus. And people became believers in Ephesus. And there was a huge temple to the god Artemis that people made sacrifices. And there was a dude, he was a silversmith, and he made all these images that he sold to people so that they could worship the god, the god Artemis. And when Paul comes in, and Paul starts rolling in, he starts sharing the gospel with people, they start giving their lives to Jesus, and all of a sudden, they don't go to the temple to worship Artemis anymore because they're worshiping the one true God. What's affecting this dude's business? And you know, money's a big deal, right? And so there's this uproar that's created, and they're going, that's why Paul has to leave. They're trying to kill him. So, so Paul's out of there, and, and he, goes, he goes next. And all of that in the will and the sovereignty of God works out for the best. Even Paul being in prison in Rome 
gives him time to stop and to write these letters to the Colossians, to the Philippians, to the churches in Ephesus. So, like I've got four commentaries right now that I'm rolling with Ephesians. I want to read what other people said about it. So I'll make sure that I'm not getting off course or off track. And i got one from uh, Charles Spurgeon, one from F.F. F. Bruce, one from John Stott. And then I've got a, one of my favorites is a, it's called Christ-Centered Exposition. And uh, the authors are Tony Morita, David Platt, and Danny Aiken, who is the president of Southeastern Seminary. Um, just good stuff. It's good to read what other people have written about this. So whenever you study the Bible, some tools that you will probably want to have is a couple of these. A pen and a highlighter, man, they come in handy. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you to do this as we go along today. You might even want to have a journal or a notebook that you write some thoughts in or write some prayers down in. Um, but if you've got a pen or a, or a highlighter today, then I'm going to ask you to do a couple things as we read through this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And here's one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do. Anytime you see the phrase, in Christ, or in Him, or through Him, I want you to underline that. Just make a note of it in there. First three chapters are going to be huge. You're going to see that phrase come up all the time. And Ephesians is really divided into two main categories. First three chapters are what we believe. This is, this is who we are in Christ. And Paul's just going to, man, he's just going to roll on. So no, he's not trying to correct anybody. He's not trying to solve a problem that a local church is having. He's just saying, listen, this is what a believer believes. This is what Jesus did. This is what we have in Christ. And then the second three chapters are, because of what we believe, this is how we behave. This is how we live. So if you start with the second three chapters and you say, well, this is how we're supposed to behave, you're going to get into a lot of legalism. And you're going to go in a lot of directions because if you don't get the first three chapters right and this is who we are in Christ, that sets up the whole heartbeat of the second three chapters. So this is a, it's a big, big deal. And you'll see that as we go. So take your, take your pen or your pencil or your highlight or whatever. Anytime you see the, the phrase in Christ, I want you to underline that. And then as we read, I want you to, anytime you see something or you, we, we cross something, you're like, I'm, I don't understand that, or I got a question about this. Like we're gonna we're gonna hit a, a big question in verse four. Chapter one, verse four, we're gonna have a big theological question that people have been going back and forth on and trying to solve for years and years and years. Predestination. What does that look like? What does that mean? So anytime you got a you got a question, just just make a little question mark. And I would love for any of the questions that you have, I would love to know some of those so that as we go through this uh, in a little finer detail, we can address some of those things. And we can say, hey, well, here's, what, here's what this, this means, or here's what this looks like, or here's, here's, here's one of those things that is, it's kind of a mystery to us. Can't really wrap our heads around it. John Stott, next week I'll, I'll tell you what John Stott says about verse 4, and it's probably the best thing I've ever read on it guy that was born in, in early 1900. So uh, it's just good stuff, good, good stuff. So this is how we really begin to grow in our faith, not by merely observing, but by actively participating, right? So this is not a, uh, the pastor is, is the person that stands up and disseminates all the information, and we are the consumers of the information. But this is a stuff where we're growing together. And this affects our life, our everyday life. Jesus offers more. So listen, if, if, you've, if you're under the impression that just coming to church sporadically is, is the pinnacle of Christian faith and life, man, you are, I'm, you're missing out. There's more to it. That's one of the reasons that we've subtitled this more than you can imagine is because, man, I don't want us to play around in the shallow end of faith when, when the ocean is offered to us. Jesus is more. And you've got to experience him in your daily life through the scripture, through prayer, which leads to practice. I think the best way that I could describe this is the first time I ever went to Disney World. So I grew up right here in, in, in northwest Arkansas in Fort Smith area over in Lavaca, okay? And like growing up there, we went to Silver Dollar City. We went to Six Flags occasionally. So like I knew what fun was, right? 
And I, man, we'd, we'd done that my whole life, and I just, it was awesome. And I, I didn't have any idea. And then uh, I had a conference that I was going to go to, and, uh, and it was in Florida. And I was like, you know what? We could, we could tag on to this, and we could take the girls to Disney World. We we're like, this is a great idea. And that, so that's what we did, and the girls were little. I mean little. And uh, so we booked the tickets, and, and we, we actually booked into the Magical Express. And I don't know if you have ever done this before, but if you fly into the airport and you're on the Magical Express, you get like this red carpet treatment. They literally have a red carpet and these gold uh, posts that you walk through, and they take you straight to a Disney shuttle. And you get on that Disney shuttle, and, and they take you all the way to the, to the hotel there on Disney property, wherever you're staying in one of the, one of the properties, and, and you get off. You don't even touch your luggage. They take it for you. Like, you get off the plane, you just roll onto this bus, sit down, and you're on your way, and boom, next thing you know, you're at your, you're at your room, and they bring your luggage to your room. It is incredible. I mean, it really was magical. First day we get there. Park's about to open. We get there early. We get right in front before they open the gates. And, man, there's this whole big singing, dancing ceremony with all the characters, and they're coming out, do 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 you know. And, and it's, my girls are just smiling from ear to ear. And it, 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 was, I mean, it was incredible. And then the gates open, and we had an appointment at the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are laughing about. This was serious business. My girls, they had these Disney princess dresses on. And if you schedule an appointment at the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, what happens is you roll in, and those girls, they get to go in, and they put them in this, in this princess chair, and they do their hair. They do their makeup. They put little, little sparklies on. They give them a little wand. They do the eyeshadow stuff. I mean, they just dote on these girls. And, man, it was It was awesome. The girls come out and they're just prancing. I mean, it was, it was so cute. And like, I'm, I'm just, it's the only place in the world that I've ever just wanted to skip. It, I, I really, hi, ho, oh, like the whole deal, it was just awesome. And then we went to, a little bit later on in the day, we went to story time with Belle. You know, Beauty and the Beast, Belle, Right? And I was starving to death by this point, so I went to get some of them $47 french fries <laughs> so I didn't die. And the girls were already in. They were sitting down, and so I'm rolling in there with my french fries in my hand, and Belle, is all, she's already telling the story, and she said, and we need someone to play the part of the beast. You, sir, in the, in the hat with the A on it. And I'm like, what schmuck has got a hat with an A? Oh, no. And it's me. So I set my french fries down, and, and I go up on stage with story time with Belle, and I'm the beast, and they put this big beast coat on me, and I've got these beast claw hands, and you really just put the, the deal on, they tie it around you, and it's this big robe and stuff. And, and so I'm the beast, right? Well, I've seen Beauty and the Beast, and there's a lot of kids there, and so I don't want to mess this thing up. I'm going to give it my good, my good and right proper performance, right? And so... So Belle's telling the story, and she's got the teapot out and all the other stuff that's going along with it, and I'm over here, and, and she says, and the beast was furious and let out a great roar. Here's my cue. <laughs> and I turned around, and I mean, I gave it a roar! <laughs> Fired up. Like I, if there was an award <laughs> for dudes that got called out of the audience to play that part, I would have had to have been in the running. And then my heart softened, and she spun me around and somehow like took the beast deal off of me all at one, all at one time. And whenever I turned back around, it was just me. And then I danced with Belle on the stage in front of everybody. I played the part so well of the beast that for about the next three hours, Caroline, who was probably about this tall at the time, would not look at me. I, it, it freaked her chicken a little bit. Like, she didn't know what to do with it. Man, it was, it was an incredible, magical experience. And the folks at Disney World, they have created a magic kingdom. It's better than Silver Dollar City. Way better. But it's not a real kingdom. 
It's manufactured. And it's, it's one that you have to experience to understand. So imagine me trying to tell people about our Disney World experience when they had never seen it, they had never been. It's, it's difficult. Yet that is exactly what Paul is trying to do in this letter to the Ephesians. He's saying this is what kingdom life looks like because this is what Christ has done for us. And because of what Christ has done for us, it transforms us from the kingdom of darkness and transforms us into the kingdom of light. And this is how we can live every day. He's imagining endless possibilities for us. He says there's more before. There's more right now. There's more to come. So as we read, as we get ready to read this, I want you to have your highlighter, your pen ready. Underline in Christ, through Christ, with Christ. Anytime you come across a verse or something that we have a question about, just make that question. Then shoot us an email, info at firstboonville.com. Say, hey, Pastor Stu, i got a question about this. We'll try to answer that. And what we find is when we read the Bible, that the Bible actually reads us. Let's pray and then we'll read. God, I pray as we go through this incredible, incredible section of Scripture that you would be glorified, that we would latch on to what all you have in store for us. All the more, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be reading this from my Bible, which is the ESV, uh, English Standard Version. It's a pretty easy translation to read. Um, if you've got a different translation, just, just hang with us. Uh, the words are also going to be on the screen as we go. So uh, if you've got your Bible and your Bible app, you may want to switch it to the ESV translation. I kind of went back and forth on what translation to read from. I, I went with mine, uh, with the ESV, just because I love the way it, it, it keeps in Christ. as the uh, That's how it translates all the way through. So, y'all ready? The letter to the, of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, before I get started, let me, I'm not going to stop at any point in this. So once, I, once, I, once we start here... We're going. No explanation, no commentary. We're rolling. All right, here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, or in Christ. In him, We have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, in him We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? Hmm. Who believe? According to the working of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all the things to the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. And though, chapter 2, and and you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying the desires of our body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, with, and seated us in the, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what, is called the un, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles, that's us, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, 
this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strengthened. And you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness, all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who ascended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain all to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to mature to the mature of the stature, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. For they have become callous and given them up to sensuality, greedy to every practice and every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth as in, is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, 
Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity And covetousness must not even be named among you, as it is improper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is a covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of life is found, of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern What is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body is and is himself its savior. Now the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, And that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. And this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife 
as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. Whether he is a bond servant or free. Masters. Do not or do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish the, all the flaming darts of the, of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all per per perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. There's something incredibly powerful about the public reading of the scriptures. I can only imagine as the churches in Ephesus, they didn't have texting, they didn't have email, so whenever they got a letter, it was, it was important to them. And I can only imagine the reaction of the church when they got that letter from, guys, we got a letter from Paul. And that's exactly what they would have done. They would have sat and they would have listened as Paul writes to them. They would have read the whole thing. And then they would have read it again. And then they would have read it again. And then they would have read it again. And they would have poured over it. Paul references a couple of spots in here. He references things from the Old Testament. Paul was assuming that there would be, at least with some of them, a familiarity with the Scriptures from the Old Testament. But as he's writing to Gentiles, he's also assuming that they do not have this, this foreknowledge, this, this association with the Scriptures, with the Jewish Old Testament at this point. This is for us. It's for us. 
How many of you have ever read through just front to back, start to finish an entire book of the Bible like that? You can all raise your hand now because we all have. How many of you guys got in there and the, it just as in, in different parts, the Lord began to convict you of things that you need to, you need to apply to your life? Things that you saw maybe in context now that it gives you a fuller meaning on what Paul is talking about here. Maybe you've just memorized a verse, but in the context of what comes before and comes after, you saw, whoa, there's a whole lot more to that. His intention was way more than I had ever seen. As we close today, I want us to begin to ingest the scriptures. So here's, here's the challenge that we have for this week. There are seven days in a week. There are six chapters in Ephesians. So I want to challenge you to either on your own, husbands and wives, or as a full-blown family. Monday is chapter 1. Tuesday is chapter 2, Wednesday is chapter 3, Thursday is chapter 4, Friday is chapter 5, and Saturday is chapter 6. Sunday, we'll come together and we'll read again and we'll continue to make it through the book of Ephesians. But what if we just took some time and we went through and really got familiar with who Jesus is? So before you get on the Facebook or the Instagram, go to the Scriptures. You might want to come, if you're going to do it as a family, you might want to come together in the evening before, before you send everybody to bed. You might want to wake up a little early. You might want to do it right there. But let's do this for a few weeks together. Let's just, let's just read. And the more we read, the fuller it makes it. And then whenever you come, you know that whenever we're, we're looking at verses 3 through 14, you know what's in that section. And you're ready to go and you're like hungry, like the wolf. May sing a little Duran Duran next week or something like that. Get just fired up. Like, and that's how we want to come. We want to come hungry, anticipating what the Lord is going to do. You got some questions in there. Man, write them down. Ask the questions. Talk about that with your family. See what the Word of God says. Man, it's, this, is how we, this is how we go to the Disney world of faith. Listen, I, I, I believe there's more than I've ever experienced that awaits. I, I haven't arrived yet. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not at Disney World trying to tell you, you guys how it's at. Like, I'm, I'm still making my way there too. And here's what I know. The more that I get serious about putting into the Word of God, the more God reveals to me. The more possibilities He opens up. The more peace He gives no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what the health situation is, no matter what the political scenario is, no matter what any of that stuff is, man, if you're in Christ, I mean, Paul's in prison when he's writing this for Pete's sake. If we're in Christ, we got nothing to worry about on that. God's kingdom is above all. Amen. And that's our ultimate citizenship. So let's live our lives that way. You may be here this morning and you say, Pastor Stu, I, you know, I've, I've, I've really not been to church a lot. I've not spent a lot of time in, in church or in faith. I, I've kind of been a little bit on the outside. There's never been a time in my life when I've actually given my life to Jesus. I've never prayed and asked Jesus to forgive my sins and given my life to him. And I, I've not ever been in Christ like Paul is talking about. I, I, need, to, I need to be there. I, I, I want to know who Jesus is. I want to be saved. I want, I want more than I could ever imagine in my life. And today could be that day. Whenever we close the service in just a moment, I'm going to ask Brother Chester and, and Brother Black Brad, they're going to be right up here on these front rows. And, and if you want to talk to, to a pastor, somebody who can, who can help walk you through or maybe pray, just pray for you. Maybe you got something that you're just, man, I just, I, I've been saved, but I've never been baptized. I need to take my next step in faith. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you, you just want to come and pray with somebody and say, hey, would you just encourage me? I need some encouragement that I can take the next step. 
in my relationship with the Lord. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe you need to join a local church. Maybe you just need to, to jump in with both feet. Listen, I would tell anybody this. What, if you're looking for a church, find a church that places a high, high value on the Word of God. If, if they don't, it's not going to be good. Listen, we, there is nothing, I don't have anything smart to say to you guys that doesn't come out of here. I can't teach you anything about life that's not given through this, this word of God. This contains everything that we have for faith and practice. For our theology and our life, our methodology, how we live, it contains everything that we need. And if we don't know it, we, we can't live. We just can't. We have to connect to the Lord through the scriptures. It's his word to us. You want to hear from the Lord? Read the scriptures. You want to hear God's voice out loud? Read the scriptures out loud. This is, it's that big of a deal. I was, I was talking to Pastor Brad this morning I was telling him about the, the greatest compliment that I've ever received came from a, from a little girl that was about nine years old. We were in Virginia, and I was doing kids and family ministries there, and her name was Reagan. And whenever we moved to Texas, a couple of months later, her mom posted a, a little deal on, on social media, and uh, she said Reagan was at the dinner table tonight, and she said, man, I sure do miss Pastor Stu. He made the Bible come alive for me. You'll never be able to say anything greater about me than that right there. If, if the legacy that the Lord's called my ministry to have is that I've got it, that there's a bunch of people in Boonville, Arkansas that, that just fall slap head over heels in love with the scriptures because it, it leads us to love the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is a big, big deal. This is how we know what our next step is to take is through the scriptures. In your life, what, what's your next step that you need to take? We'll find it in the scriptures. Ephesians is powerful. Kyle Snodgrass says that uh, pound for pound Ephesians may be the most influential document ever written. It's pretty strong. And I've read several commentaries and, and those are the type of things that we hear about Ephesians. Why? It's because it's for, it's for us. It's for the church. It's for the individual believer. Big C church, little C church, individual. It's, all, it's got it all. Right? It's Hulk Hogan will say, it's got it all, brother. It does. So as we close today, our members are on our way out. Uh, our ushers are going to be at the door and they'll have our, our offering plates and if you give in person, you can drop your offering in that offering plate on your way out. If you give online, praise the Lord. If you're a guest with us and you've got your purple card, um, I, I would love, Sarah and I are going to make our way to the, to the front doors uh, right here. And I would love to just shake your hand, tell you hello, um, fist bump, high five, bow, whatever, whatever, whatever greeting you're comfortable with. All right? and, uh, and I'd love to just, just get a chance to meet you real quick this morning. So. If you've got a decision that you need to make, as a matter of fact, let's do this. Brother Brad, would you come up here and just play for just a moment? We're just going to have kind of a time of, of, of prayer, time of reflection. And just, I'd just ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Just like there's nobody else in the room but you and the Lord, and just, just talk to him. Say, Lord, what is it that I need to know about you? What is it that I need to do to know you better, to know you more? What is it that I can do this week that will bring my life more in line with what it means to live as a believer, as a Christ follower? Because you heard it just like I did. This is a time to live as wise, not as foolish, because the days are what? Days are evil. Listen, we got to be all in. There may be some, 
some things this week that you need to stop. Some habits that are not producing holiness, but they're producing unholiness. Paul says, you, that's not what you've learned in Christ. Put away those former things. Run to Christ. Now, does that mean that you're going to be perfect? You're never going to trip up? You're never going to mess up? Absolutely not. And that's why grace matters so much. Because He gives more grace. But the posture of your heart, it matters. You're going to get out of the Scripture, out of your relationship with Christ, out of the church, exactly what you put into it. So let's be all in. Father, I thank you so much that you have not left us without your word, without instruction, without the ability to know how to live, how to, how to behave, how to believe, Lord. You haven't left us without the ability to know you. But we're going to be confident in our faith. We don't have to be tossed around by every crazy doctrine or what's going on in the world, Lord, but we can be, we can be solid as a rock in you, in Christ. So, Lord, I pray that this week you would, you would turn our heart's desire. Lord, that you would peel the scales off of our eyes and let us see who we are. Help us to know that if we are in you, we've been made a new creation. And that the old things in our life, have, they're passed away and they're passing away, Lord. And that everything is becoming new in you. And that is better. God, we thank you that, that you haven't left us on our own, but you have given us the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that as he convicts us this week, we would experience a closeness with you that we've not experienced in a long time or before maybe even. But you would, you would draw and begin a revival in our hearts. Lord, a passion to know you and to live for you and to love you that, that we've not experienced. Lord, from teenagers to our kids, to our families, Lord, as they read the scriptures together, just a short chapter a day, Lord, I pray that you would begin to bring light into our life. Expose the darkness and turn us to you. Shine on us. And Lord, we will give you the praise and the glory for all that you are going to do. Lord, I pray that it would be more than we could ever imagine. More than all we could ask or think according to the incredible power that works in us through Christ Jesus. And it's in him, His name we pray. Amen. And amen. Bring somebody with you next week. Invite a friend. Get out there and, uh, and make it happen this week. And we will see you next Sunday. You are dismissed.